Well, good morning and welcome to our three-week series entitled Scripture Scandals. Here's where we're headed for three weeks. We want to look at those scandals that arise out of the topic of the Bible itself. These are not scandalous stories in the Bible. We spent a whole summer talking about those recently at the Meeting House. We're talking about the Bible itself as a topic and some of the scandals, some of the controversy, some of the mystery that comes our way when we ask the question, where did it come from? How was it written? Uh, how is it being used? We've got, we've got scandals to shock and surprise everyone. Step right this way. We've got things that will not only surprise you, but may also offend you. We, there are scandals that will, uh, there'll be many of you who say, you guys are just taking this Bible thing way too seriously. But may I also say there will be some people from a more conservative religious background who will be scandalized saying, you guys are not taking this the way I was taught to take this. And all I can ask is that you listen with an open heart and open mind and uh, make your own mind up. Now, you've got program notes for you or notes in your programs. Regardless of what site you're watching from, you can take those out right now and you can see where we're headed over the next three weeks. You can see that this week, our topic is understanding the issues. This morning is going to be kind of a broad overview of some of the issues that come to the surface immediately when we talk about the Bible, how to use it, and, um, and, uh, and, and how to apply it to our lives. And then part two, next week we will have a more academic, rigorous morning as we look at the development of what's called the canon, the selection of what books of the Bible were chosen to be included and what books were excluded and how that process came about and who was making that call within the church. We will look at that process over the first few hundred years of the church's existence next Sunday. And then in week three, we'll look at some of the issues that arise and how we try and apply the Bible, some of the abuses of how the Bible gets used uh, or applied in our lives today. But each week, we'll talk about some of those abuses. Um, and, uh, and we'll start with one in just a few minutes as we talk about Reverend Paul Hill. But I want to pause for a second and say that this is a very auspicious occasion. This morning is actually the birthday celebration of our Tri-Cities site. So Tri-Cities people, we salute you. This is, they've been having a, what we call a soft launch for the last few weeks, kind of behind the scenes, but this morning is their first official, what we call the hard launch. And uh, so I thought we, uh, it would be great to sing them happy birthday. What do you think? Because today is their birthday. I mean, we're not celebrating and they're not even one year old. This is their birthday, so we might as well start singing it now. So across all of our sites, how about we celebrate the new kid in the family? What are we up to now? Is that six sites? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'd be a terrible father of a large family. I, I forget how many kids we got now, but... Uh, uh, let's, across all of our sites, let's sing happy birthday to the Tri-Cities site. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Pick it up, people. Happy birthday to you. Come on now. Happy birthday, dear Tri-Cities. Happy birthday to you. Wonderful. That's great. We're so glad you guys are there. Now, we're going from something celebratory to actually something quite serious. I want to introduce you to a character whose name is Paul Hill. You see his picture in your notes. I wanted you to have his picture so you would have something to remember him by. You would look at his face and say, this looks like a sweet man. I wouldn't mind hanging out with him, and you would be right. As I read this man's journal, as I read a book that he wrote, I find myself saying, hey, Paul, I'd love to hang out with you, have you over for supper, you're a neat guy. I find myself slipping into this form of thinking whenever I forget what Paul Hill is known for, walking up to a man putting a shotgun in his chest and blowing him away. Paul Hill is a pastor, an evangelical, fundamentalist, Bible-believing minister who lives by his convictions, or I should say lived by his convictions. He was executed uh, in 2003 by lethal injection. Paul Hill, family man, as you read his memoirs, loves God with all his heart. Loves his family, his wife, his kids. S will serve anyone's needs, people would say. Loved the Bible so much that he was passionately committed to live out whatever the Bible taught. And so, because of his dedication to the Bible, on uh, the morning of July 29th in 1994, when he made his way to the abortion clinic, 
where he was a regular protester, that morning he decided he needed to resolve to go beyond simply protesting. Took a concealed shotgun, and since he had been there regularly, he knew the routine of when the uh, head of the clinic would arrive. And now he had, was in the practice of arriving with um, a bodyguard because there was a sense that there could be violence. Some, they, some of them had been vocalizing violence, but wondering who's going to be the first in the name of Jesus to kill. And on that morning, it was Reverend Paul Hill. He approached the car as the doctor was driving in with his bodyguard and his wife. As soon as they turned off the engine, knowing they would have no exit strategy, he immediately walked over, shotgun directly point blank range, shot the doctor, and then shot his bodyguard and uh, injured his wife. He did this for only one reason. He did this because he was convinced this is what Scripture taught was the right thing to do. What Scripture? Uh, the Bible. The Bible that I read, the Bible that you read if you attend the meeting house, and if you decide to attend here for some time, we want to encourage you to read it. Although right now, this might not seem like a very good commercial. <laughs> he read this book and was convinced the only right thing he could do if he was going to live with himself was to stop the abortions by any means necessary, including killing. But you know what? Makes sense from a biblical point of view. Uh, doesn't the Bible tell us, for instance, that we should defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy? That we should rescue those being led away to death? Says Proverbs, both Proverbs 31 and Proverbs 24. Defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. Rescue those who are being led away to death. The Bible is replete with injunctions to do whatever it takes to stand up for the oppressed. And within the context where these scriptures were written in Proverbs during the Old Testament Kingdom of Israel days, violence was the way you went to defend the needy. If there was a nation that was being oppressed or an individual that was being oppressed, you went to war. The, I mean, you, you can't say that the Bible's not full of examples of violence being seen as the example of a righteous response to injustice. So if you could think of any scenario in your life where you would ever do violence to another human being, shouldn't it at least be to stop the killing of the innocent unborn? And so it made sense to him, if I would ever consider going to war for my country, killing for a, a, a national cause, if I would ever consider defending my family, if I would ever consider using violence, surely this has got to be a scenario where my conscience tells me I can't go another day without saving the children by killing the doctor. You know what? It is a biblically sound argument except for one small piece of the biblical puzzle. His name is Jesus. Without the Jesus factor, Dr. or Reverend Paul Hill, he, he makes sense. But you see, Jesus comes and teaches us that the Bible's purpose, the Bible's use is to point to Christ and that Christ will model for us and will show us what it means to live a life that honors God. The Bible points us to Jesus. Jesus then teaches us how to live. And Jesus does encourage us to defend the rights of the afflicted and to rescue those who are being led away to death. He does encourage us to stand up for the weak and for the needy. But he teaches regularly and then models this with his own life that it is never okay to kill for a just cause, although it is always okay to die for a just cause. What Jesus says is, here's what you do. Find ways to lay your life down, as I will model for you. But don't ever take another life for that cause. It's always okay to die for your cause. It's just never okay to kill for your cause. And so those who are with Jesus, like the Apostle John, writes this in his letter, 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for others. This then becomes the focal point of the New Testament church. And this becomes the rubric that helps us understand, interpret, and apply the Bible to our lives. You can't, 
you can't do justice to the scriptural revelation if you take away the Jesus factor in it all. It seems to me that in an attempt to follow the Bible, there are many fundamentalists who have stopped following Jesus. And as wonderful as a Christian pastor might think the Bible is, and I happen to be a Christian pastor, so you'll pardon me if I say some good things about the Bible as well. As wonderful as I think this book is, this book is not my God. This book is not the one I follow. This book is a tool to help me learn about and follow the one called Jesus who teaches me a different way to live and transforms my life. And so the Apostle Paul writes things like this in Romans 10, 4. Christ is the culmination of the law. Christ is the culmination of the law. Or depending on the English translation, it might say Christ is the end of the law. The word is telos in Greek. It means the end point destination, what everything is leading up to and pointing towards. The law that is the written text of the Old Testament, the scriptures as Paul knew them in his day, Jesus is the telos. He is the meaning behind it all. He is the end point destination. He's what everything is pointing towards. And so we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. This is... If you get nothing else out of this message, remember, remember that one point, that the Bible itself says, don't just follow the Bible. The Bible says, let, let us point you towards Jesus. Please follow Christ. Now, to give you just some basic training, some basic facts about the Bible, because uh, I understand many of us are arriving here today from a variety of backgrounds, some church, some unchurched. You see, uh, you see some facts that are listed there in your notes, 66 books in the Bible, um, over 40 authors contributing to them over a, over a millennium of time span, which, just to put it in context, other scriptures um, do not have this diversity and unity. Not all scriptures are the same. And when we look, for instance, at the Quran, we have the Quran revealed to one man, Muhammad, by an angel, and that puts a, a lot of trust on one man to say he is speaking for God in all things. When we look at the Book of Mormon, again, one man, Joseph Smith, who finds the tablets that the angel leads him to. Uh, again, one man offering all the scriptures. When we look at the Bible, again, you have over 40 authors over a 1,500 year time span writing in different languages from different cultures and in multiple genres. You see here in your notes, history, poetry, law, parable, biography, prophecy. There's official church correspondence as well as personal correspondence, letters. And, uh, and apocalyptic literature. By the way, keep that in mind. Sometimes people will ask a silly question. They'll say, so do you believe the Bible is literally true? And the question is actually a category mistake. That's one of those questions that people ask when they don't really know enough to ask a question that makes sense. And I think our job at that point is to help educate them to the point where they can ask a sensible question. Do you believe the Bible is literally true? Well, what do you mean? Do you mean the literal parts? Uh, uh, do you mean the poetic parts, the parabolic parts, the, uh, the apocalyptic literature? What do you mean do I believe the Bible is literally true? Uh, some questions are just a disconnect with reality. It's like someone asking the, the age-old trick question, do you think God could make a rock that's so big that even he couldn't lift it? You know, do you th is that possible? Could he make a rock that is so heavy that even God couldn't lift it? Because they think they're very clever. Because no matter what you answer, you've backed yourself into a corner. You say, well, yes, he could make a rock that's so heavy even he couldn't lift it. He couldn't lift it. You see, he's not omnipotent. He can't do everything. Oh, you got me. I feel silly. I guess I'll stop being a believer. <laughs> or you could say, no, there's nothing God can't do. So he couldn't make a rock that's so heavy that even he couldn't lift it. He couldn't? So there's something he couldn't do. You got me again. <laughs> I've been wasting my time on this Jesus business. Some, some questions are just word plays. You know, we like to have fun with words, and that's just having fun with words. And if someone's asking you a stupid question that's just having fun with words, give them an answer that's just a stupid answer that's having fun with words. So if somebody asks me, could God make a rock that's too heavy for even him to lift? My answer is always yes. He could make a rock that's too heavy for even him to lift. And then he would lift it. And then they say, hey, wait, 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 that, that doesn't make sense. And I say, well, neither did your question, so at least we're speaking the same language, right? It's good. <laughs> now let's talk real talk. Stupid question. So, do you believe the Bible's literally true? We just have to help each other grow up and ask real questions. The Bible speaks in a variety of genres. What do people think about the Bible? What are some opinions that are out there? Um, you see this, uh, by the way, th these are primarily opinions about the New Testament. 
the focus of this series will be the New Testament. We'll be talking about the Old Testament as well, that part written before Jesus. Um, but just for the sake of time, I, I don't think we could do justice to covering the canonization process of both the old and the new and some of the issues that arise to the surface. We have talked about this, these issues before in another series. If you want to dig deeper, go back and listen to the series called God's Library. And in that series, we talk about both old and new uh, testaments, but our emphasis will be on the formation of the New Testament for this series. What are some opinions that people have? All right, well, it's a record of faith and history of the early Jesus movement. Everyone agrees about that. You can't deny that, that the New Testament is a record of the faith and the history of the early Jesus movement. You can, you can argue whether or not it's a good, a good historical source to get back to Jesus in person, but at least this is a good record of what the early church believed in the first century. We are getting back to ancient history of the first generation of the Messiah movement. All scholars, believers or non-believers, at least agree about that. There is amazing history within these pages. That's a great starting point. It's not time wasted to study this amazing movement. I would argue again, as uh, most scholars would say, we have within these pages, number two, our best written source to access the historical Jesus. Our best written source to access the historical Jesus. Now, not just the Jesus movement, the people who are producing these texts, but the historical Jesus himself. Scholars will disagree to the degree that these texts lead to the historical Jesus, but we'll all agree these are the best texts that we've got. They just happen to be the most ancient that exist. Number three, many will believe that the Bible is a God-inspired guide for life and for faith. Some believers will go beyond that to claim that the Bible itself is perfect, inerrant, the authoritative Word of God. And you see also listed there a number of words like inspired, authoritative, infallible, inerrant, and what those mean or what many Christians mean when they use those terms. Where do you find yourself on the scale? Even if you're just hanging out around number one or number two on the scale, we've got a common starting point for some doing, I think, some meaningful investigation that can make a difference for us. Now, what does the Bible say about itself? Here's our modest goal for this morning. What does the Bible, when it self-comments about its own writings, what is, what, is it, uh, what is it suggesting its identity is? 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says this, all scripture is God-breathed or God-inspired, depending on your translation, or inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God or God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is prepared to thoroughly equip us for every good work. Now, it's interesting because many people, when talking about the value of the Bible, will want to jump straight to emphasizing, well, it is the inerrant, perfect word of God without mistake and any point, and that's, they want to drive to that immediately. The Bible actually never claims that for itself. It claims perfection for, for the word of God made flesh. His name is Jesus. The Bible doesn't... Um, doesn't necessarily claim on all points that it, as a writing, is inerrant or is perfect or is sinless or is free of any mistake. What it does say about itself is this. Here's the word, ready? All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful. That's not that sensational. Hey, Paul, what do you think about the Bible? It's useful. No, really, it is. You can use it for a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, no, training and correcting and rebuking. It's really useful. It's a good book. It's useful. You should use it. It's a useful book. It's useful. And what is it useful for? It's equipping you. What for? For theological purity and debates with others with whom you disagree. No, <laughs> actually, Paul would say, no, it's really useful for equipping you for every good deed, for every good work. Yeah, you know, you, you should read it for application, for your life. Then it's really useful. Uh, uh, good work, every good work. And how you should, and well, where do, where do we, well, remember, Paul's already said it points us to Jesus. He's the telos, he's the culmination of Scripture, points to Jesus, and he'll give you the example. Here, here's, a, here's the difference between being useful and, 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 and when we make it unuseful through our attitudes. It's like a window. The Bible's like, a, a, what's a window? A window's really useful, don't you think? But it's not useful as an endpoint destination. 
As an endpoint destination, a window's pretty useless. Not too many people hang a window on their wall. Say, hey, you like our window? It's not, it's not really worth looking at, is it? But it is useful if it replaces the wall and it's used to look through. A window finds its value because it allows you to see everything else. And some of us within certain Christian circles fixate on staring at the window instead of looking through the window. We catch sight of our own reflection in the window. We find that exciting. Look, if I turn the lights up inside and it's dark outside, I can look at me. It can be a mirror. And many of us come to the scriptures in exactly that way. But the scriptures are designed to be a window. They're useful to help you look through and to see Jesus and see Jesus clearly. Not just come with your own agendas, but see Jesus. And until you actually allow them to take you to their endpoint destination, you will abuse the scriptures, and they will not be useful. They will be destructive in your life. Not, not, even, not even neutral, destructive. As Paul Hill and many others will testify. And by the way, Paul Hill's not alone. This is a, this is a, a significant movement within American culture. Um, Michael Bray is a pastor who... Uh, continues to counsel people. He's a pastor, Bible fundamentalist, loves his family, loves God, loves Jesus, loves his Bible, and based on the Bible, counsels people to kill abortionists. Um, he as yet has not decided to do that. He sees himself as more of the chaplain of the movement to encourage others to do that. And there's, there's tours and there's, uh, there's groups of people who rally regularly to um, support this particular position. <clears throat> what does the Bible say about itself? It says it's inspired. It's God-breathed. It's useful. How about authoritative? Does the Bible say it's authoritative? Well, yes and no. Let's talk about what it means here. Um, first of all, authority is always something that the Scripture see as residing in a person, not a thing. The idea of a thing having authority is a bit foreign to our relational God. God is authoritative. God has authority. Jesus has all authority vested in him. That's what he says at the end of the book of Matthew. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he gives them the great commission and he sends them off. But now Jesus is not with us in the flesh anymore. He is with us in spirit. Now what is the locus of his authority on earth? Or where does his truth reside? What is what is the container that continues to hold on to the truth of Christ for every generation? If it is not Jesus, the Word made flesh, what is it? Uh, you know, as an evangelical Christian, I would be tempted to say, well, the Bible, of course, if, if, you know, now that Jesus has moved on as the Word made flesh, we have the Word made print and page, and that's the receptacle of truth where that authority lies. It's not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is, it's, is that it's the church, actually. It's God's People. Jesus passes the torch to people, not to a thing. So Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3.15 about the church being God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The pillar and foundation of the truth. Now, pillar and foundation of the truth, I would assume that's either Jesus or it's the word that we would call the Bible, not the church itself. But from a biblical perspective, Truth and authority is always passed on from person to person to person. Jesus said, I am the light of the world while I am in the world. He says this in John 9. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Otherwise, he passes the privilege of being light bearers to his people. You are the light of the world. Jesus says that his body is the temple of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 2. Otherwise, he passes the privilege of being the temple of the Holy Spirit onto his people. He doesn't pass it on to a book. Say, now the Bible will be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible will be the light of the world. Now, now uh, the Bible will be the pillar and foundation of truth. It is people. It is first his apostles, and then that we continue within the church community to steward that. We do it imperfectly, absolutely. That's the thing. Whenever, whenever God enters into a partnership with us, the end result has a great chance of being flawed because we are flawed people. But God chooses partnership over efficiency. Always chooses partnership over efficiency. He could do it all himself, say, out of the way, boys. Great commission, I'm going to evangelize the world. Uh, bringing justice, I'm going to do it. Uh, feeding the hungry, let me do it. And he could do it perfectly. He could do it immediately. There'd be no mistakes. There'd be, you know, politics wouldn't get in the way. 
but instead he chooses because he is a relational God to partner with his people and things take more time, they are inefficient, they are done in a flawed manner, but God is honored because he's doing it in, the, in partnership with his creation. He's made us in his image, not so that he can sit us on a mantelpiece and say, isn't that a great look of art? Come over here, uh, uh, come over here, angels, and take a look. We're functional works of art. We, we give him glory as we live our lives, as we make choices. So I, I still am left with a question. How, how come the New Covenant writers, the New Testament writers, do not emphasize the text to the degree that I would think they would? How come they... They honor the text, but ultimately they point to Jesus. Well, I think the answer is because that's what the Old Covenant promised. The Old Covenant promised a new covenant that would not focus on the text, but would focus on the people themselves. Open up your Bibles with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. It's in the middle of the Old Testament. Well, probably in the middle of your Bible. Or if you find Psalms and Proverbs in the middle of your Bible, turn right, flip a few pages. If you have a New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs are at the end and you turn right, you're, well, you're just going to be turning all day. You're not going to find it. <clears throat> so Jeremiah chapter 31. We'll just start at verse 31 of Jeremiah chapter 31. Now this is the Old Covenant, Old Testament, which was a covenant that focused on the text, may I say. Just to give you a context for the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was a text covenant. When God gave the Torah to Moses, God gave it in Hebrew, word for word. It wasn't spread out over a whole bunch of people. He'd given it to Moses. He says, listen, the Ten Commandments himself, God wrote with his own finger. He said, look, there's not going to be any mistake. They're not going to get lost in translation. This is, now I'm starting to get in rabbi mode here for a second. I, I want to I I get into this now. He said, listen, you don't, you don't mess with this. God says, I'm going to write this it was my own finger, Ten Commandments. And then everything else, Moses, I'm going to dictate directly to you. And it's in Hebrew. God gives it in the language that is its endpoint destination, Hebrew, which is why many rabbis see Hebrew as a sacred language. It is the language that God himself spoke to Moses to give him the Torah. So now, that's why often they'll, they'll see in every letter, in every word that's used, in every, every, uh, every combination of words, there could be something there that is mysterious and wonderful. And it's true, you have a text-based covenant. But within the old covenant, that's why, of course, you see the Pharisees at the time of Jesus are text-based, and they can't believe the fact that Jesus is going around loving people, and he's not necessarily following the text. And they wrestle with this because they're used to a text-based covenant. But they forget that the old covenant itself promised through Ezekiel that a new covenant would be qualitatively different. And so in uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 31, "'Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant, verse 33, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And it's plural, within them. I'll put my law, singular, within them, plural. And on their, plural, heart, singular. I will write it within the community. The community will steward the truth. That's why Paul in one of his epistles can write to the Christians that he's discipled. He said, you know what, you're like living letters. You're like people read you. You're like the new covenant texts, the church itself, the people. And why can he talk that way? As, a, as someone who was stewarded within a Pharisaic rabbinical tradition, you would think that the apostle Paul would say it's about the text, it's about the new Torah, it is about studying the words themselves in God's sacred language. But no, he says the people are the living letters. God writes it on our hearts. There's something qualitatively different. There's no going back. And so he says things like this in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. God has made us competent ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It is a qualitative contrast between the nature of the old covenant as a text-based covenant and the nature of the new covenant, which is a heart community-based covenant. So that's why he can say things like the church is the pillar and foundation. By church, by the way, he's not referring to an institution, an ecclesiastical institution with a, a strong hierarchy. The church in the biblical writing means the gathering of the people, the saints, the community, the spiritual organic community. It is the people of God together. That, you're, you're, the, you're the new covenant, the pillar and, and the foundation of the truth. 
It doesn't mean then that we ignore the writings or that we say, wait, we just magically or mysteriously have truth inside us. We don't need the writings. It is the church gathered around, the church gathered around the apostles' teaching that stewards the truth. We see this from the beginning. The church, the church stewarded the truth by coming back to the apostles' teaching. So in Acts 2, 42, we read this. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching because the apostles were their link to Jesus. And as a Christ-following movement, that's what you do to do good history. You get in touch with the person who was there, who was the eyewitness. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, not as an endpoint destination, teach us about Jesus. And they devote themselves to living it out. They are not just an educational organization. You say they devote, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and uh, to fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. They live it out, and the teaching is lived out in their hearts. This is what the new covenant is supposed to look like. So, some Christians say that the Bible is inerrant. They say that it is perfect in every way, and you can examine it on any level in the text and find perfection, and I wonder if they're confusing Old Covenant with New Covenant. Remember, yes, in the Old Covenant, Deuteronomy 9.10 says, just to remind you, the Lord gave me, says Moses, the two tablets of stone written by the finger of God. But is that the case for the New Covenant, or is it God partnering with His people to get the message out? The people themselves ultimately are the living letters of which the written text bears witness. Let me push this a little further. This only begins to make sense when you see that the New Testament emphasis for what the Word of God is, is not actually, not actually the words of a text, but is ultimately a person and his message. The Word of God is Jesus. You see, the New Covenant enfleshes the Word, incarnates the Word, and then passes that torch on to people. So we read in John 1, verse 1 and 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a little bit later in the chapter, it goes on to say, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. He spoke to us through the prophets, and we have that written down now in, the, in, uh, in our scrolls. But what it doesn't say, now he speaks to us through our New Testament scrolls and our, our new writings. It says, through the past, God spoke to us through the prophets, says Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. But now he speaks to us through his Son, through the person of Jesus. You see this in your notes? According to the Bible, the Word of God is Jesus and his message. See this? According to the Bible itself, the Word of God is Jesus and His message, not His specific words. The specific words, Old Covenant text-based concept. According to the New Covenant, according to the Bible, the Word of God is Jesus and His message, not His specific words. For instance, case in point, uh, we, we had a Grow Up conference recently at the Meeting House. It was wonderful to have people from all different sites here. One of the workshops was on evangelism. We talked about Paul's paradigmatic evangelistic message in Acts chapter 17. An amazing example of a wonderful uh, message communicating the gospel of Jesus to people who have no scriptural background. Now what's fascinating within that context or within that example is that Paul never once quotes scripture. Uh, he would be accused by many conservative religious Christians today as really dropping the ball. Do you not know that God's word shall not return void? You have to make sure you season it with Scripture. If you don't, it's going to be powerless. Paul, but I, I would say, I wouldn't accuse Paul of saying that he did not proclaim the Word of God. From a new covenant standpoint, Paul proclaimed the Word of God. He didn't have to quote specific text for it to be the Word of God. He gave the gospel. He gave the message of Jesus. That's the Word of God. We don't sell him short and say, too bad he didn't use the Word of God. It is the message of Jesus that is the Word of God. It's the message of Scripture, not the specific words from a New Covenant context. We can see that the New Testament apostles were moved by the Spirit, I would argue, to emphasize this by making a radical decision. When it came time to write 
the Gospels. They had orally passed on the tradition of the teachings of Jesus for some time, and then it came time to write it down. When it came time to write the Gospels, what did they do? They did not write the Gospels, the books that record the teachings of Jesus. They did not write them in the words of Jesus. See, sometimes we forget. The New Testament Gospels are written in what language? Greek. But what language did Jesus speak? Aramaic. Jesus didn't speak Greek. When it came time to write down the teachings of Jesus, the apostles didn't say, it's very important we have the exact words. And you'd think, coming out of a Jewish context, that would be their emphasis. But that's Old Covenant thinking. And they had been with Jesus, and they understood the radical change of the New Covenant. It's about the message. It's about the word, not the words. So they never even write down the actual words of Jesus. Even the original Greek texts are already a translation. And they say, why Greek? Because it's the lingua franca of the day. It's the language that everybody's speaking. Our own people are speaking Aramaic, but we want this to go far and wide. So it's more important for us to get the message out there than it is to give us a tool to obsess about the details of the specific words that Jesus taught. So we'll never know the specific words he used, but we have as a translation from the beginning. And that protects us from turning his words into some form of magical talisman, from obsessing on the text, but saying, what is his heart? What is the message that he's teaching? Okay, we've got a few moments for Q&A. What are you thinking? We've got uh, people with microphones. Do you have a question about anything said or anything left unsaid? Here's a hand right here. We're going to go quick for the sake of time, and then do we have anyone else? We'll do a couple of questions. If we've got, if there is someone else, you have to flag down our person with a microphone, or we'll just have one question. Okay, here we go. All right, you said, um, like for Paul Hill, for example, like, so um, I'm going to ask you, that, so he misinterpreted the message of the Bible and took it as his own word. Therefore, so his misinterpretation of the Bible gave him a, uh, he thought was a godly result, but to how he got there was ungodly means. So he didn't truly yes. follow the message of the Bible because the Old Covenant, um, as it shows, uh, continues to press forward that the New Covenant shall come, that Jesus is on his way. That's right. And therefore, he didn't follow the message. That's right. Paul Hill followed a version of the Bible's message minus Jesus. What you get in the Bible minus Jesus is a covenant that does justify violence under certain circumstances. Jesus comes and says, listen, I know you're gonna be tempted to want to, I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna use violence for everything, you might as well use it for an eternal purpose. I mean, that's what the Spanish Inquisition said. Look, if we're ever going to, people use torture for political means, for, listen, what's a little bit of torture if it's gonna save someone's eternal soul? It makes logical sense. And then, well, why don't we use force to convert the heathen? If it's going to mean that, that, that eventually they'll spend eternity in heaven, it's a small price to pay. Jesus says, listen, I know you're going to be tempted to think that way. That's why violence, uh, nonviolence becomes the non-negotiable for Jesus. Love your enemies, turn the other cheek. And he brings this into context. And this is the, this is the thing that uh, some Christians miss, is that, that the radical enemy love teaching of Jesus Great, thanks for saying. Uh, anyone else? So whoever has the mic. Nobody has a mic? Does somebody have a mic? All right. Hi. Hi. Um, is this one? Okay. There we yes, go. it is. Um, what do you think about when, uh, okay, at the end of Revelations where it talks about if somebody adds to my words, if somebody adds to these words, uh, the plagues will be added to them, or somebody takes away, they'll get their position taken away. Yeah, it's a wonder, wonderful uh, both promise and threat at the end of the book of Revelation. Revelation is actually the one book in the New Testament that claims to be a revelation from God. And at the closing of the end of Revelation, he says, don't take away from these words and don't add to them. Well, yes, well, the writer of Revelation is referring to his book, yes. But again, his, I think his understanding is not don't take out the word the or put in the word the, it is don't, don't take away from this message. That seems to be the New Testament understanding of our relationship with text. Don't take away from this message and don't, uh, don't add anything to this message. This is a direct revelation from God. The book of Revelation is the only book that actually makes that claim. It's great, thanks. Okay, here's what we'll do. Let me share a concluding thought and send you on your way. And uh, we'll, we'll have more time for questions as this uh, series progresses. Here's, here's a cure for the Bible fundamentalist in you. From the lips of Jesus. 
It's not his exact words. <laughs> we don't have them, even in the original Greek. But what we do have is what we trust is a spirit-inspired, faithful translation of what Jesus meant. You know what that does? That frees us up from turning his words into some sort of magical talisman. You know, what, what if we actually, what if Jesus wrote down his books or told the disciples, okay, wrote down his words and word for word, get this right. We would like, this is actually the word and he would pronounce it this way and this is what he would sound like. And you know what, if you wave this over, you get a miracle and if you just, all we have to do, and if you recite this backwards, you know the mir numerical total of the Sermon on the Mount adds to and that prophesies that. And if we actually, we would go nuts about the idolatry of his words. And Jesus protects us from that. You know the don't miss the forest for the trees? Back up and say, what's the message? The fixating on the words is what the Pharisees were doing and Jesus had to challenge them and so he said this to them. You search the scriptures. This is what he's saying to the religious fundamentalists. You search the scriptures because you believe they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me that you refuse to come to me so that I can give you this eternal life. As Christ followers, guess, guess what? We're supposed to follow Christ. And the Bible is our window to see him. So do we have our noses in this book? Absolutely. Do we honor it? Absolutely. But not as our endpoint destination. Always saying, God, help us get closer to Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for ultimately making the word alive to us in Christ, for giving us a living example for maintaining that example through the generations by your spirit, for leaving us a written record. And I pray you will teach us how to steward this record, record appropriately that we might follow Jesus in all that we do. Amen.